Well, people are uh, filling in, and at least the people in this room are getting lunch. I suspect the people at the university and other places online are getting lunch, too. So I'll start the introduction. Uh, we're very pleased today uh, to have Dr. Susan Essek join us. She's the Edna Edison Professor of Psychiatry at Columbia. I want to tell you a little bit about her background because this is, in fact, our department's most prestigious annual lecture. Uh, I've lost track of how many years this goes back. But Dr. Ripley was our first department chairman who uh, was appointed, I think, about 1950, which is about a year or a year and a half after the school was actually formed. He was um, uh, state chair until the late 60s uh, and was still on the faculty when I was a resident in the 70s. At that time, he was running the consultation service at the university. A lovely, warm, genial, kind, thoughtful, very experienced uh, clinician man who, like his generation, had been first trained in psychoanalysis and then done research and things. And just a really lovely person. And the department established this lectureship uh, uh, later. I'm not sure precisely when. And it really is to denote and highlight and honor people who've made and are making significant contributions to the field. And that's certainly the case today. So let me tell you a little bit about Susan, and then we'll have a chance to hear her comments. She was trained, initially got her undergraduate degree at Holyoke College in psychology, her PhD at Brown University. Uh, she went then for a postdoctoral training program in mental health at UCLA at the uh, MPI. Uh, she uh, then went to Connecticut, where she got some additional specialized psychology training and her psychology internship uh, to get credentialed and licensed. Went back to UCLA in 1980 uh, as an assistant and associate research psychologist. In 19, and I, very interesting, you move about every six, seven years. So there's these epochs that are pretty cool. Um, she became the director of psychological services at, at the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services in 1987. Uh, she became a clinical associate professor at Yale in 89, a professor at the Department of Educational Psychology uh, a little bit later in, uh, at the University of Connecticut. In 1998, another big change occurred. Uh, she became a professor and director of the Division of Health Services Research at Mount Sinai, uh, working with some close friends of mine, uh, and then also became the associate director for health services research as part of the Veterans um, MIREC program, Mental Illness Research Education and Clinical Centers, one of which we have is here as well at RVA. Uh, a senior research scientist in the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, uh, then another change in 2007, uh, went to her current appointment. She's a professor, a tenured professor at the uh, Columbia University Department of Psychiatry and also the director of the Division of Mental Health Services and Policy Research at Columbia, as well as the director of the Department of Mental Health Services and Policy Research at the New York Psychiatric Institute. As you might imagine, uh, she's acquired a significant number of honors. There are several that are pretty impressive, so I want to mention them, actually. Uh, she's been, uh, uh, for about well, 1990 to 2011, on the IBM Corporation's Mental Health Advisory Board, where she, I think, has had significant influence. She's been awarded the Distinguished Scientist Award from the Connecticut Psychological Association. She's a fellow of the American Psychological Association. A Jules LaFall, is it? Or La yeah. Jules LaFall, a PhD award for distinguished contributions to research in, um, public, and in public service. She was... Uh, uh, received a commendation from the governor uh, from the state of Connecticut and an official citation for her distinguished contributions to mental health services. That's something we all do. Gerald Claremont Award for Outstanding Achievement from the Association of Clinical Psychological Research, a Distinguished Achievement Award, uh, Research Psychologist in Public Service for the American Psychological Association. Excuse me here a moment. And as you can imagine, uh, given her experience, and we'll hear about some of her work in a moment, she's been the chair of a number of advisory groups uh, and NIMH panels. Importantly, she's been a member uh, and the chair of the NIMH Services Research Review Committee, has been the chair of the National Institutes of Mental Health Intervention Research Review Committee, and a member of the NIMH National Mental Health Adv uh, Policy and Advisory Council the very highest levels of NIH sort of determining how we use our research resources. Her research has largely been focused on facilitating the translation of evidence-based research into policy 
and into practice and then assessing how well that's being performed in the quality of care with a very heavy emphasis on the chronically and seriously mentally ill in, situa in set settings very much like this one. Um, since 1999, she's worked closely uh, with New York State Office of Mental Health and the New York City Department of Health, helping these agencies to evaluate the impact of these initiatives, ranging from things like crisis counseling to improve psychotropic uh, prescribing practices. And she's developed in the last few years some very apparently accessible web-based training modules that we can try to access ourselves. So she's going to tell us today about her evolution of this work and specifically talk about reducing antipsychotic polypharmacy using second generation injectables, which is a very major focus for us here in Washington as well. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Essek. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I, as you heard, I really focus on very practical mental health services research questions, which you guys do too. So it's, it's always a, a pleasure to come here and to be here. So, I, my disclosures, I, I'm an employee of both Columbia University and the New York State Office of Mental Health. And today I'm going to talk about a very common clinical situation. You know, one time or another, most people with schizophrenia and their, pers and their prescribers wonder, you know, should I continue on my current antipsychotic regimen or switch to something else. You know, and, and today we're going to talk about a series of these stay versus switch questions. And the answer to that is, you know, it depends. And we're going to go through some of the things it depends on. So a common variation on the stay versus switch question and, and uh, their associated best bets is what we'll go through. And so the first one is, should I stay on my current antipsychotic or switch to clozapine? And I like telling you about this one. And I think when I was here maybe six or so years ago, I, I used a window of this study for a different purpose. But today I want to introduce it as, as an early stay versus switch question. And this was uh, it, back in 1990. Clozapine was the first new antipsychotic in decades. The excitement around it was huge. The controversy around it was huge. And it came out at a cost of $8,000 per patient per year. And we certainly have ones that top that now. But at the time, it was such a stunning price that when somebody told it to me over the phone, I remember standing up. It was just that shocking. Uh, and so that meant it came with huge allocation uh, challenges, because when you sort of ran the numbers to estimate how many people in your system might be eligible for a trial on clozapine and multiply that times $8,000, it was way more money than you had to spend on medication. And so with those allocation challenges then came, uh, you know, you want to allocate things fairly, not just to the, the squeaky wheel. And what fairness fairly meant was an equal chance of access among eligible individuals. And, and to do that, you need really clearly defined eligibility criteria that could be uniformly applied. Well, when you operationalize that, it's a dream setting for a randomized trial because you have your eligibility criteria, you shop around at the different state hospitals, which is where we decided to start. You apply those eligibility criteria, and then you know you know, if you have 20 slots per hospital, whatever it is, equal access among eligibles is like a lottery. And, and, and you're left with a very strong uh, control group. So what I'll talk about first is this three-site three randomized control trial that uh, came out in Schizophrenia Bulletin with a lovely string of collaborators back when we were in Connecticut the eligibility criteria were that you needed a chart diagnosis of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, so wide, and that you had to have failed to respond to adequate trials on at least two different antipsychotic medications. Clozapine then is now is not a first-line medication. It's for people who have had a chance on other medications and haven't responded well to them. And uh, absence of a medical contraindication to clozapine. 
And th so those first three were pretty much how you operationalize the package insert. The fourth one is one we applied. Um, you needed a current state hospitalization of at least four months with a total hospitalization of at least two of the preceding five years. So really people who were stuck in the state hospitals. And so you would hope that if you um, were stuck in the state hospital with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, that it would be easy to show that you had had access to at least two previous trials. And that was our first surprise of the study, is that really only about 60% of the people could we find evidence of, of two trials of at least six weeks duration, one of which was a non-phenothiazine. So that, that started some cleanup right away, that we provided lists of who didn't yet have those trials to the chiefs of the various wards and let them get started. So what did it look like? Well, um, this is a survival <coughs> curve showing the time from uh, randomization to discharge. And the y-axis here is the proportion who are still in the hospital, the proportion who haven't been discharged. And remember, these are people who have at least four months for their current hospitalization, and they spent two of the past five years in the hospital. So not surprisingly, or surprisingly, depending on how you look at it, look at this. If, if you were randomized to clozapine, 12 months later, about 40% of you had gotten out of the hospital, not quite 40%. And so what did it look like for people in the control group? what well, looked about the same. And so this is why you do randomized trials, because if, if, and there were all these mirror image trials at the time. Now mirror image, I mean, you look at how much the person had been in the hospital prior to starting clozapine, you look later, you see how huge the decrease was, you estimate the savings and say, wow, you know, just buy a lot of that medication. And this was exactly what the, uh, study sponsored by the manufacturer showed. So um, what else was going on during this time? Well, at time zero, there were about 3,000 beds in the state hospitals, in these three state hospitals. And by two years later, there were maybe 900 beds. And so there was a huge downsizing of the state hospitals coincident with the study. There are time effects in any study we do, where, when, you know, unless you do a one-day study. So it's, um, th this is always my example of why, if you can possibly manage it, you do a randomized trial. Now, um, what did clozapine look like on time to readmission? For those people who had gotten out, look at this. Uh, if you got out, odds were excellent that uh, you, you would stay out. You know, 12 months later, 12 months after you got out, 20% of you had gone back in. What did that look like for the control group? You know, they went back in more often. And the uh, differences we found in uh, things like well, what amounts to violence are, were, as, as we later saw, you know, clozapine helps you uh, we called it the 7-Eleven effect, that you can just sort of hang out at a convenience store. You don't have that rigidity. You uh, can pass better, and you don't get into fights with people. So, um, you know, great medication for, for people for whom it's indicated. So 10 years later, what was the stay versus switch question? Well, 10 years later, uh, it was time for the Katie trial the uh, clinical effectiveness of the variety of antipsychotic medications because by that time there was more than clozapine available as second generation agents. Most of the ones that are available today were available then. And so the CATI trial was a study designed to assess the relative effectiveness of switching to medication X versus medication Y. Katie was conceived of as this switch switch study. Should I take, you know, if, if I'm going to change medications, which one is the best bet to put the person on? 
Fortunately, or fortuitously, Katie also provides us information on the stay versus switch question for the most commonly prescribed antipsychotics at the time. And I, this is my group of collaborators for this further analysis of Katie data. So the Katie included these really broad inclusion criteria, you know, diagnosis of schizophrenia, an adult. Uh, you weren't first episode and you weren't called treatment resistant. You weren't a prime clozapine candidate. And uh, you could have any concomitant medications, medical illnesses, substance use disorders, all fine. And it was conducted at 57 geographically, demographically, and organizationally diverse sites. So this is, this is you know, great effectiveness work. And the participants were 1,400 people with schizophrenia. And people could participate in a given trial for up to 18 months. And it, the design is characterized as this practical clinical trial that was a hybrid of uh, efficacy and effectiveness. So what was the design here? You know, the people came in and they were randomized either to one of five medications, olanzapine, perfenazine, a first generation agent, and the huge controversy around whether that, whether it was ethical to include a first generation agent in this trial. That was the discussion in the year 2000. Uh, Cotiapine, risperidone, and then zeprazidone came onto the market during the trial, and once it was there, it was also a, a randomization um, option. And so you could come in to Katie on olanzapine, and you would be randomly assigned to one of these five medications, including olanzapine. So if you came in, to, if you were one of the 322 people who came into Katie on a, already taking olanzapine, you, know, you had a 20% odds of being assigned to stay. And Katie is a double blind study. So you were, uh, it, it's a very pure look at this stay versus switch question. Similarly, with risperidone, the second most popular agent of the day, 275 people came in and, you know, 20% of them were assigned to stay with risperidone. Cotiapine, 95 came in. And then all the other possible combinations uh, that included one of those more common agents, you know, had an element of staying in it then. Or all of the other medications. And then a hefty number, 414 people came into Katie, not on any medication. And those were the true switch versus switch individuals. So out of all of this, you see that there, there are some lines where you were randomly assigned to continue taking what you were already on at study entry. So our first question is, if you exclude those individuals whose random assignment involved staying with the antipsychotic medication they were taking at study entry, what, if any, impact would there be on the Katie Phase I results? All right, so to remind, so, so what that means is, here's all those possible combinations. What if we just take away the individuals who are those stayers? And to remind you, the KD phase one results um, showed that the pink line, olanzapine, the time to all cause discontinuation for olanzapine was less than the other medications, which pretty much hung together. All right. And when you exclude the stayers, now here, it's, it's the effect of, is no longer significant. You, you've decreased the power because you've taken out individuals. And you've also narrowed the, the gap a little. But I, I mean, I would, uh, you know, the, the, the altar of statistical significance is not one we need to worship on. And do these lines look? very different. You know, the, the story might have had a different presentation if it had come out this way. Um, the overall take home of Katie was these medications perform about the same. Maybe olanzapine has a slight edge in terms of 
time to all cause discontinuation, it certainly has some metabolic liabilities that were uh, apparent in Katie and elsewhere at the time. So let's ask another question using these data. For those participants who entered Katie already on olanzapine, risperidone, or catiapine monotherapy, you know, those three most common agents at the time, did those assigned to stay on the same medication do better or worse than those assigned to switch? These are people who entered a trial to change medications. You've got to assume that, and, and, and they were symptomatic when they entered Katie. You know, if you were doing just fine, you're not eligible. Um, so who would you think would do better? The stayers who stayed on what they were already on when they entered this trial, or the switchers? And does it matter, depending on what you switch to? So um, what this would mean is the guys who came in on olanzapine will compare those who stayed, were randomly assigned to stay on olanzapine with those that were randomly assigned to go to one of these other medications with roughly, roughly, you know, 60 to 70 people per cell except the zeprazidone arm because it was late to start, has about 40. Well, here's what it looks like. The time to all cause discontinuation, if you started on olanzapine, odds were much more in your favor for staying with it, if, if, for, for staying with your assigned medication if you simply stayed on olanzapine. You, you didn't beat what you were already on. And zeprazidone looked pretty bad, and the rest looked about the same. So what did it look like for Risperidone. All right, you come in on risperidone compared to everybody else. It looks about the same, whether you stayed, whether you switched. And what about catiapine? And here the ends are getting very small, you know, roughly 15 to 20 per, per line. And not surprisingly, they're very noisy, but, you know, not much of a story here either. So this is sort of surprising, or you know, it, it was to those of us who um, asked for a further look at these data, and I, I'm very grateful that the, the people who ran this, this massive trial agreed to that, uh, these further analyses, that uh, you actually, you know, it, it switching, you, you didn't have a great gain overall expected by switching. So for many people, even those game to enter a trial involving switching antipsychotic medication, it's hard to beat the current medication. And even in randomized clinical trials, there can be biases in estimates of treatment response because of differences in the study participants' exposure to treatment prior to the trial. So all that I said in that first uh, the clozapine study about the importance of a, a randomized trial or the value of a randomized trial, you know, the second point to add to that is you don't start with blank slates when you begin a randomized trial. And very few people come into a trial treatment naive. And so my current trajectory is part of what you're randomizing. And so random assignment to treatment condition alone is not a sufficient safeguard to eliminate this bias. So let's, our, our third question looking at the KB data is, did switching antipsychotic medications impact weight? You know, if, if you are gaining weight with these medications or if you simply weigh, for whatever you weigh, is switching a way to uh, deal with weight gain? And the collaborators on this, um, and here are people who entered the trial on olanzapine and uh, were randomly assigned to stay on olanzapine, and you see that they continue to gain weight versus those who entered the trial on olanzapine and were switched to one of these other agents. And you see that, you know, risperidone was pretty much weight neutral, and the other three, yeah. You, you lose weight by that switch. Um, oop, what did that do? Sorry, let's get out of this. I need my glasses. There we go. Okay, so um, 
the conclusions there, those who stayed on olanzapine showed greater weight gain than those who switched from olanzapine to other drugs. And now, what's our stay versus switch question in 2010? These are the, the newer data I'll be talking about today. Uh, with a ton of collaborators. This was a uh, multi-site trial that we did to look at um, a antipsychotic polypharmacy question. You know, many practice guidelines discourage antipsychotic polypharmacy, yet it remains a really popular practice. So an important question is, should I stay on two antipsychotic medications or should I discontinue one of them? Now, another important question is, should I have ever gone to polypharmacy in the first place? And we have no trial data on that. But uh, this one, this one we do. So uh, the methods for it, we had 15 sites uh, that came from the, the KD network, the NIMH Schizophrenia Trials Network, as well as five sites in the public mental health system in Connecticut. Uh, the eligibility criteria were you were an outpatient, uh, 18 years of age or older, you had a skid diagnosis of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, and you were currently prescribed two antipsychotic medications, neither of which was clozapine. We figured if you had gotten on clozapine, there was something special about your route there. We weren't going to mess with that. And neither of which was PRNs. Uh, and, and for Ketiapine, because so many people were uh, supposedly using it for as a sleep aid, uh, we said you had to have a dosage of at least 100 milligrams or, or greater. And that you were currently taking the prescribed antipsychotic medications, meaning that uh, you had a plasma level of greater than zero for both medications. A lot of people on polypharmacy don't necessarily have both of them in their blood. Uh, and that you hadn't recently been hospitalized, operationalized as, as in the past six months. This was really a study for this optional switchers. You know, you're, you're on polypharmacy, you're, you're doing well enough that staying on it, staying on your current regimen is a reasonable choice. Um, so are you better off staying or switching? And the design here, you, 127 people came in on two antipsychotics and they were randomly assigned either to stay on both of them or to discontinue one of them. The physician and client together you know, chose which one was discontinued. And then we followed them for six months. And at the end of six months, we followed them for another six months, but it was at that point, we asked them to stay in their assigned condition unless clinically you just had to change it for that first six month and then after that we said you know, we'll keep track of you but do what you like. So uh, what were the most common antipsychotic combinations at study entry? Think about what they would be today and think about what they were in 2010. You know, the, the rates of, of prescribing antipsychotics vary enormously over time as, as information about weight gain, et cetera, comes out, as drugs go off label and advertising stops, as you know, all of these effects combined. Well, then the <coughs> most common drug was ketiapine, followed by risperidone, followed by Haldol, followed by olanzapine, or apriprazole. Okay, so these are the drugs uh, that were making up the combinations. So who did better? Participants who were randomly assigned to stay on both antipsychotic medications or participants who were randomly assigned to switch to monotherapy by discontinuing either baseline antipsychotic? What are you guessing? So here's what the time to medication change for any reason looks like for the people who were assigned simply to stay on their polypharmacy. And you see that people who were assigned, and, and these are open label, blinded uh, rater trials. And so part of, we, we opted to do these open label because part of a, a switch or medication change involves the expectation effects. And so those are very much part of, of what we see here. And if you stay on polypharmacy, you know, by the end of that six month trial period, you know, maybe almost 85% of you, a little over 85%, we're still on that same 
two medication combination. So what do the switchers look like if you discontinue either one of them? Well, if you discontinue either one of them, you were more likely to change medications. And so I, only 70% of you were still on your assigned monotherapy at the end of six months. So I, you notice it's not down here. So that for people who would say, I, well, what are the downsides or upsides of staying on polypharmacy versus switching to monotherapy? Does it change symptomatology as measured by the PANS? No, right on top of each other. So you, know, you, you don't have significantly different um, symptom control. What about change in body mass? If you stayed on polypharmacy, you slowly continue to gain. And if you switch to monotherapy, you lose. And at the end of six months, you've got a change of what? That's about, you know, not quite one BMI. And the, you know, the guidelines for when you intervene <coughs> is about, you know, if somebody's gained one BMI, you, you want to take that seriously. So, let's see, equivalent symptom control and I lose weight. And I don't have these data to show you, but we've just finished the, the look at what your total medication load is. And for the people who were assigned to monotherapy and stayed on monotherapy, it, it, it was about halved. So you really did take away one medication and, and you didn't up the, uh, the other. So you have a, a lesser load as well as a simpler regimen. So the walk away from this was individuals assigned to switch to monotherapy did have shorter times to all cause discontinuation than those in the stay condition. Changing medication did come with some air turbulence that made changes. Of those who discontinued monotherapy, most simply returned to their previous polypharm combination. And weight loss was a benefit of switching to monotherapy. So trials of switches to monotherapy appear to have few risks and possible benefits. So the guidelines that say, or, or the QI initiatives that go after, let's, let's see what we can do to uh, diminish polypharmacy, these support that, you know, it's a good idea. Right, so I'll repeat the question for those of you not in the room. And the question was, what about uh, adverse events such as hospitalization? And you know, the sample sizes are small, but there wasn't a hint that it was different between these two groups. Okay, uh, ooh, so let's go back to read this. So the other uh, stay versus switch study I want to talk to you about is um, People who are on a conventional injectable medication, <coughs> should you stay on that one or you, should you switch to injectable uh, risperidone microspheres? Okay. So with the advent of a long-acting injectable you know, risperidone, individuals on a conventional injectable medication, you, know, you, you now have the option of a second generation. For these individuals, an important clinical question is, should I stay on my current injectable or switch to injectable risperidone? So that's a clinical question you know, that clearly the individual cares about. The payer also cares about it enormously because of the, the huge price difference between the newer agent and the uh, two first generation agents. And so a lot of the similar collaborators, again, done on the um, KD network, where the setting was, and, and these are all NIMH-funded studies. I don't know if I mentioned that, but so no pharma funding in any of these. Uh, the 15 study sites in the NIMH uh, schizophrenia trials network, the same sites as well as the five sites in the public mental health system in Connecticut. Eligibility criteria, very similar to the previous study. You were an outpatient, 18 or older, skid diagnosis of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, currently taking flufenazine or haloperidol DEC, okay? And uh, you were currently taking the prescribed medication. And here, we would either take plasma level or if you were at a center that had a record of the injection, we said, 
you know, we didn't need a blood level then. It was somebody recorded that they, that you received the injection. Um, so I, this, the trial design, very similar. You're currently on an injectable conventional, 62 people. You're randomly assigned to stay on that injectable or to switch to injectable risperidone. And you're asked to stay on that assigned condition for six months. And then we had uh, naturalistic follow-up for another six months. So what did this look like? So if you're assigned to stay on your conventional medication, you know, 12 months out, well, six months out, 12 months out look about the same, that 90% of you were, were still taking that medication, you know, as we think of it. You know, it's a very stable uh, regimen. If you were assigned to switch, again, like in the studies we've been talking about before, switching uh, wasn't a good idea insofar as it dis you, you were unlikely to stay on, on that regimen. That uh, six months out, about 20% uh, had discontinued it. And you know. so, um, what else happened? But you know, remember in the polypharm, I looked at a difference like this and said, not so bad. You know, that um, you try it. If you don't like it, you go back to what you were on. This one, you try it. And what else changed? So if you stayed on your first generation, it was pretty weight neutral over time. However, if you switch to injectable uh, risperidone microspheres, the gain is almost to um, BMI. So um, what about prolactin? If you stay on your first generation, the, the white area is um, you know, within normal limits. The pink is elevated prolactin. And if you stay, it's pretty flat. And if you switch, it edges up you know, some. So the conclusions from this, switching from a conventional injectable to injectable risperidone was not associated with improved symptom control. Um, and switching from a conventional injectable to injectable risperidone was associated with additional weight gain and additional prolactin levels. And so the state system in New York took this as, as reason to say, as reason actively to discourage the use of um, this very expensive medication. So the take home from these are, uh, the available antipsychotic medications have considerable limitations. Not only does one size not fit all, one size doesn't even fit most. You know? And so while I, I'm talking about how it's hard to beat what you're currently on, I don't want to make it sound like those are necessarily good news. Unless clinical situations require a medication change, taking steps to optimize the current medication by dosage adjustments, by psychosocial interventions, may be more effective than a medication change. And we need prospective studies of the effectiveness of adding a second antipsychotic. You know, what, what was that a good idea in the first place? The Policy-relevant clinical trials require lots of good partners. Investing time and being a good colleague makes such work possible. And this was in, in my conversations with people this morning. We talked some about how you partner with your public mental health system so that you are asking questions they care about and you're doing them in ways that feed back information very quickly. Like back in that Connecticut clozapine study, when we found out that only 60% of people on these long stay state hospital wards, only 60% could we find two adequate trials. You know, that's the kind of stuff you can shop to a newspaper and get a flashy big um, headline once and never be welcome in that system again. <laughs> Or you can take those data and go you know, meet with the medical directors and say, yikes, look at this. What do you think we should do about it? How about if we give a list by ward, sorted by ward? Do you want to give them out? Do you want us to go? How, do, how should we handle this? And then you're a partner you know, for change. And 
I, and you figured out a way to make the information, even from the screening data, a, a payoff from day one, because these studies are long to do. And so finding some payoff early really helps you have you know, a partner. So oh, that was, so th that's, that's what I wanted to go through, and I would welcome any questions you might have. So, and, and now I'm going to look at, uh, that's right, I'm going to close this so I can see if any people from the outside are typing in questions. Let me just get this minimized. <coughs> okay, no question. Yes, here. During the switch, was there, um, when you randomized that, was there a, was there a common a monotherapy that was used? Uh, ah, because of the discussion between the patient and yep, the Yep, yep. So the, the question is, when you, when you did the switch, um, was there a monotherapy that was selected more often than other monotherapies? And, and that, that is exactly that slide that I decided to skip over. So now, <laughs> wait, wait. Oh, here it is, here it is. All right, so let's, let's look at this one. Um, is. Okay, so it, it, it's, it's very hard to present those data, but what this shows are the various, the, pop, the most popular combinations. So the very most popular combination was catiapine, catiapine plus some first generation agent. But, you know, it was only 10 people who had that combination. And I, half of them chose to continue the catiapine, and half chose to continue the first generation agent. The next most cop common polypharm going in was olanzapine plus a FGA, and you know, it came in with nine people, four stayed on the FGA, five stayed on the olanzapine. So it's all onesies, twosies kinds of combinations. And the What, what else here? So these look like it's only one medication because they came in on, say, aripiprazole and olanzapine, and they stayed on aripiprazole. So nobody's, you know, that one. So it's, it's all over the place, and this is one of the reasons why it's a killer to get that study about um, if you are on monotherapy, is it a good idea to go to polypharm you know, to start with? Because, and we have banged our head against that with review groups, and the comments always come back, oh, but we think you should be using this combination, or how can you let it vary, or what would be the agent you would add? And the world is not that tidy. And so I um, despair, we, we gave up, and this was you know, a lovely group of we. It was uh, John Kane, Steve Martyr, uh, you know, a, a bunch of us from this just said uh, you know, this, this was a study that needed to be done, and we've, we've given up. Yep. Although it's not in the data that you showed, if someone were to be going on uh, IM medications, looking at first generation versus second generation, can you speak to that? You yeah. Recommend Nina Schooler, Peter Wyden, uh, they have a trial that went at that. And it suggests there's no benefit of going to injectable risperidone. And particularly since you can get more weeks out of the lexin in terms of the, you know. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. All right, so let me get back to the question before. So, so the question, th so the answer is, or the question was, um, w what about uh, injectables going to? A, a conventional injectable versus uh, injectable risperidone, going from an oral to a conventional. And I said Schooler et al., I think, are the ones to turn to for those data, and that it, um, they didn't separate. Yeah. 